What side do you want? Well, that's the good mic. You Is this it. the good mic? Oh. Yeah. I'd like to thank you all for being here for Kevin's intervention. <laughs> Actually, the only reason I'm doing this is to reserve a room at the home. What are you talking about? <laughs> I know you. I'm Shields. He's Yarnell. <laughs> okay. It's impossible to discuss our next resident without using some lofty words. Pioneer, maverick, visionary. But perhaps the best way to describe Stanley Kramer is courageous. Decades ago, he made a movie that rocked the very foundation of Hollywood. It's a hard-hitting social commentary that exposed America's dark fascination with greed, dishonesty, Oedipal fixation, sexual harassment, and police corruption. He took a huge financial and artistic risk with that one film, a risk no filmmaker had taken before or since. Not Frank Capra, not John Ford, not James Cameron, not even Steven Spielberg dared attempt what Stanley Kramer so brazenly accomplished in 1963. He made a comedy with a running time of three hours and 12 minutes. A comedy so long it required an intermission. Even more astounding, that picture was a major hit. <laughs> Stanley Kramer grew up uh, among the hardship of New York's Hell's Kitchen. He arrived in Hollywood straight from college and he went to work moving furniture on movie sets. He was drafted into World War II and he made films and newsreels for the Army Signal Corps. After the war and after years of pounding the pavement, Stanley found financing for his debut film from a Florida garment tycoon. The movie, So This Is New York, was in Stanley's own words a colossal failure. Nobody saw it. So Stanley was able to convince a Salinas lettuce farmer to guarantee his next picture. In a career that spanned four decades, Stanley Kramer produced 35 pictures of which he directed 15. These films earned 85 Oscar nominations and won 15 Academy Awards. These enduring classics include Marlon Brando's film debut, The Men, which addressed the problems of disabled veterans of World War II. High Noon, which challenged the sanctity of the Western genre. The Kane Mutiny, which exposed military incompetence. On the Beach, the first major film to deal with the possibility of nuclear holocaust. Inherit the Wind, which fundamentalists dubbed Kramer the devil's first deputy. And Judgment at Nuremberg, which examined those responsible for the atrocities in World War II. He raised eyebrows by casting Tony Curtis as the bigoted convict and the defiant ones. In fact, no one was more skeptical than the actor whom Curtis would be shackled to throughout the entire production. Yes, Sidney Poitier had his doubts and wasn't shy about sharing them with Stanley, but Stanley was right. Tony did a hell of a job, and the Academy agreed they were both nominated for Best Actor. When Stanley set his sights on producing and directing Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, he told the studio heads he wanted to make a romantic drama starring Katherine Hepburn, Spencer Tracy, and Sidney Poitier. It's a simple picture about marriage. That sounded commercial enough to them, so they gave him the green light. <clears throat> All right, but when Columbia found out this was a romance between a uh, white woman and a black man, <laughs> they did what studios do best. They freaked. And they uh, <laughs> tried to worm their way out of it. They used Spencer Tracy's frail health as an excuse to refuse the financing. And in an act of solidarity with his best friend Spencer, Stanley put up his entire fee to secure the picture's completion. It was the fourth and final picture they made together. Spencer died a week after the film wrapped. And once again, Stanley's courage paid off. Guess Who's Coming to Dinner became a worldwide smash, a multiple Oscar winner, and remains a landmark film to this day. The Hollywood of today is owed in no small measure to the handful of men and women like Stanley Kramer who stood fast in difficult days and align themselves with those values by which they conducted their lives as men, wives, husbands, mothers, fathers, citizens, and as artists. For that, we are all in Stanley Kramer's debt. Thanks to the Motion Picture and Television Fund, Stanley maintains his independent spirit and dignity in spite of serious medical challenges. I want to be recognized as someone who knew how to use film as a real weapon against discrimination, hatred, prejudice, and excessive power. Don't congratulate me. Just be happy for me. I've been blessed to be a part of the motion picture industry almost all my life.
nobody aspires to get older and nobody aspires to get ill and have to leave their family. But he's a courageous man and his first concern was of course his family. So he thought he would try it. And he's having a wonderful time. He's better than he's ever been. He's much healthier than he's ever been. We go out and do things together.